Guys, can we have a round of applause for our first guest speaker, please? Tristan White of PhysioCo. Thank you very much, Tristan. And Lisa Spiden of Fiber HR. Can you come and join us, Lisa? Round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Okay, guys, so what's going to happen is I'll just ask maybe three or four questions and then we'll put it out to you guys. Hopefully, you've got your questions at the ready. Um, so I might as well start with you, Tristan. Um, coming back to those early days of you kind of battling with yourself and, and getting over the, you know, the, the internal conflict that goes on within, can you elaborate a little bit more about how you got over that, how you kind of dealt with that and, yeah. Yeah, entirely, entirely. And I think the, uh, again, I'm going to quote one of my favourite authors, and that, that is Jim Collins, who I already mentioned. Um, but he calls it uh, a very important skill of us um, business owners and entrepreneurs productive paranoia and he, he, he's researched this and he describes it and that is that yes I was paranoid there's no question about whether I was doing the right thing I was frozen at times and it was a real challenge for me to, to manage that um, but I still remain productive I still continue to edge forward test new things try new things didn't stop in my tracks I certainly didn't move as far as fast forward as I could have um, but I think the answer to your question is uh, is to edge forward, momentum builds momentum in, in my experience. And so really dealing with that, the, the speed that I could move forward now compared to what I did in those early days um, is, is phenomenally greater. But I think the answer to the, to the challenge is wherever, you, wherever you're feeling, uh, I think it's important to, to move forward, to test something new, to try something new and, and make, in terms of startup businesses, make sales. Sales is where, where the action really, really starts in terms of, uh, of, of growing the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lisa as well. So Tristan talks a lot about that self-belief and he wish he had more of that in the early stages as well. Have you ever encountered those moments of lacking in self-belief? Um, yeah, I think, I think everyone who runs a business at some point uh, sort of questions whether they're on the right track or that there are hard times, you know, running a business. So I, I think that's really normal to have some self-doubt. I think, though, to be able to have a successful business, you need to know deep down, though, that your business actually has got legs and, and that you believe in it. So even through some really challenging times, as long as you can sort of sit back and be able to say, uh, I'm really confident with the direction that we're going and with the product. I think that's what gets, well, that's what has got me through those challenging times. But I think that's normal as a part of running it, running mm -hmm. a business. Yeah, excellent. And Tristan, just to, um, in fact, this is going to go over to you still, Lisa, sorry. But Tristan talked about the one thing that he <laughs> wished he told himself back then, which was the self-belief. Is the one thing that you, if you could go back in time and tell yourself? Oh, I can, one thing, there's a thousand things that I wish I could have uh, gone back. I think, um, ooh, I'm trying to think of, of the one thing. I, I think it's really around having amazing people around you that you can bounce ideas off. So mentors and, uh, and people that you actually trust that can help guide you. I don't think, I don't think anyone can go the whole uh, road alone. Um, so it's making sure you find those really uh, people that you trust around you and people who have done it before. So, you know, people who have built businesses the size that you want to build them or overcome challenges that you want to overcome. I think it just helps, A, keep you sane <laughs> uh, and B, helps you hopefully not fall down some of the potholes that you will if you try and navigate it through yourself. So that, that's probably one thing that if in hindsight, I would have found some people quicker that I think could have helped with that journey. But I, I guess that's, that is a part of, of the learning. Mm -hmm. And this is probably going out to both of you as well. And so you both talked a lot about leadership and setting the example and obviously over communicating certain things. In the times of difficulties, is it okay for your staff members to see that you're having a difficult time? And how do your emotions come across on a day-to-day -day basis with your employees? I'll pass over to you in two seconds, Tristan. I'll go through that one first. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really important that your staff see you as normal and see you as vulnerable and see that you are affected by what's working really well and what's not working really well. But after nine years of running my own business, I'm also really conscious that my mood affects my team. So I'm pretty much on stage the whole time, whether I want to be or not. You know, so there's some days that you go to work and, and I'm feeling flat or not motivated or frustrated. And there's days where I have to make a certain conscious decision to not <laughs> express that or to really monitor how I react because I've noticed over the journey that if I'm feeling flat or really frustrated, if I appear to be like that in a team meeting, I can walk out of the meeting and the whole office is flat. You know, so 
I, I just know that the way that I'm behaving very quickly um, reflects or, or filters through the rest of the organisation. So, so there are some times that I, I you know, am very comfortable with the team seeing how I'm feeling. I, I'm very comfortable the whole time the team seeing how I'm feeling, but there are some times that I have to actually be very conscious around how I behave to make sure that it doesn't filter and become a bigger issue um, that I then have to manage with the rest of the team trying to pick them up. That, that is probably one of the challenges that I find of, of being a leader is constantly your mood is affecting the rest of the office and therefore there is less opportunity for you to be flat or pissed off or you know you can do all of those things but you just have to be conscious around it then affecting other people. Look, I think it's perfectly fine that people see your frustration and emotions and, and, and challenge, but the speed at which you move from below the line behaviour to above the line behaviour is, is critical. Uh, there, there is no room for blame, there is no room for excuses or, um, or, or any below the line sort of behaviour that, um, that I describe. It. It's as a leader, we take responsibility, we take ownership and we take action around what, what's happened. So uh, absolutely let people know that, um, that you're pissed off or frustrated or can't believe this has happened again, uh, then look internally and realise, did you not communicate it clearly enough the first time? What, what is it that you can do to learn to then move it, move it forward? Um, but to reinforce what Lisa just said, and um, as a leader, it is always showtime. There is no moment of your life where it's not showtime, but you can be vulnerable and be authentic, but then you need to move back to, uh, to taking responsibility very, very quickly. Great answers, guys. So I'm going to put this out to the audience. Has anybody got a question for us, please? Oh, um, I'm going to um, maybe give you one of these mics if that's okay. And we can move. Would that work best? Um, hi. Thank you both for sharing your stories. Um, one point that really resonated with me was the challenge between balancing culture and people and business requirements. Um, in my personal experience. I didn't cope so well with this. I tended to be there for my team from nine to five and try and get all my work done outside of those hours. Completely not manageable. Um, how do you guys do that? So firstly, you're not alone. Uh, I think that's important to, to acknowledge and and I think as a leader I used to think that I need to be there first in the morning, morning and leave last at night. There's no part of me that didn't used to think that and live it, uh, but you don't. Uh, it's, and I think the answer uh, in my uh, experience has been a daily check, if not more often than that. And with every, and a team is built up of a whole lot of different people, depending on whether it's a one, two, three, four person team, and then a whole lot of different relationships. I think it's really important that you do a, a quick pulse check as to where your, your focus is as yourself that day, re reflective of your own leadership approach, and then consider where are the people in your team sitting on that, um, on that continuum. Because if someone's having a crap day or a crap week, and you are 100% focused on the numbers, then there's gonna be a clash, it's not gonna work out well. Uh, but if someone is really, really uh, engaged and, and wants to do something to build more, um, make sales, build relationships, do something very people focused, and you want them head down to their computer um, doing some analysis sort of work, again, not gonna work out. So I think it's really important to be aware of your own self, be aware of what each individual team, person in your team where they're at, and then reconcile that with what the business needs at that moment in time. It's really hard, but it's a continual check, refine, balanced type of response from me. Uh, that's the way I do my best to, to, to manage it. I don't get it right all the time, uh, but, but that's, that's the way I go about it. That is a really tricky one, and as Tristan said, I think that's really common with most people who run a business. I've got an open plan and I sit on the floor with my team, and that can cause challenges in itself because you are so available to the team that I literally could be back to back with people coming and asking questions the entire time. What I've started to do is make sure that at the beginning of every day or the beginning of every week, I'm really clear of what I need to have achieved by the end of the week or the end of the day to move the business forward. Uh, and then it means that when people come and speak to me and ask me a question, I actually, right at the start, can say, so what's, what's the, what is the question? What do we want to cover off? And I have to make the call around whether that's a priority that's going to stop something for them or whether what I need to actually work on is a higher priority. And it's taken me a while to be able to say, I'm really sorry, guys, we're going to need to park that and come back to it in a couple of days. 
I've got things that are more urgent to, to work on at the moment. So I think it's a, a common issue, but by doing that doesn't negate, it doesn't make you a bad leader or you're pushing away or not supporting your team. Uh, I just explain what I'm working on. I said, really sorry guys, I've got to get this, this and this out. You know, if it's a two, que two minute question, I'll quickly answer it for you so you can keep moving. But if it's something we need to discuss in more detail, then I just need to keep going with what I've got on. But I've heard some really cool things that people have worked on. It. I, I haven't implemented them. I know of people who've got a flag on their desk and they say, yeah, it doesn't work. Put the flag on the desk and if there's a flag there, don't distract me. I've got other people who, who will force themselves to work from home one day. So they know that on that day, it's a power day to, to get through some things that are not available or others that literally will lock themselves away in a room. So everyone does it differently. I just found that I, you know, I am available on the floor and I just push back and say, I'm really sorry, guys, I've got something else that's more pressing at the moment. Do you share your goals that you set for yourself at the beginning of the week with the team or it's just as they need to know? Depends what it is. If it's something we're working on as a team, absolutely. If it's something like capital raising or restructuring or something that maybe <laughs> they're not aware of, um, I probably don't share that kind of information and I'll just say I'm working on the business. That, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Wonderful presentations. Um, I assume that you've both had experience managing remote teams. Have you got tools, tech, tips that uh, you can share with us? Tristan will have way more experience in this because you've got a, a national team. I've got one person who works interstate. Um, and uh, experience in retail. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That, that's true. Um, in terms of technology and things, I mean, we just use GoToMeetings so that all the meetings they're involved in, where they're technically in the same room. Um, we use Slack, so uh, it's a communication tool. Um, our day-to-day -day chats are on Slack. Uh, in terms of all of the other things, there's nothing really fancy that we use that I can share that, that's whiz -bang. I think Tristan will probably have more to add on this one. So um, I just use sort of the normal uh, sort of communication channels, but. Uh, great question, it's really tough, um, but the, the answer from my perspective is planned and unplanned communication. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, every member of our team is in a short, sharp huddle call every single day of their working life. And so our support team here in South Melbourne is in a, in a 10.05 huddle where we, we huddle for 12 minutes to, to pulse on what's important today, what are we working on, where are we stuck, and in, any other movements we need to work on. Short, sharp meeting there. Every one of our team members around the country are also on a short call to, uh, to connect. So that's, that's one example of planned communication. Um, on the unplanned, uh, it's a responsibility of me and the leaders in our business to pick up the phone unexpectedly, unplanned, and check in with the team and say, hey, it, it's Tristo here, just calling to see what I can do to help out. Uh, and I think connecting in both planned and unplanned ways, crazily, the unplanned is planned from the leader's perspective, it's unplanned from the person re receiving the call. Uh, so. Continuous communication, I, I'm old school. I, I really think that you, you need to have one-to-many and one-to-one -one communications. And this is, this is as old as it gets, but we actually send out a letter in an envelope to our team member's house um, once a quarter or thereabouts with an update as to what's going on at the physio co so that them and potentially their housemates or husbands, wives and kids can actually see what's going on in, in the workplace. So I think many channels, many ways, Planned and unplanned is, is my answer. Anybody else out there? Thanks very much, both of you. Um, I was thrilled to hear you both talk of um, the dynamic nature and the relational nature of the culture. I wonder if you could speak to the impact of bringing just one new person into the business and the impact that they can have on a culture or cultures and how you would manage that. Are we talking a positive influence or a less positive influence? Both. Okay. So from my perspective, every single new hire should add to the average of the team. Uh, and so uh, I don't think we should ever, in, in my, and I'm talking about in, in an established team, in an established team, I don't think there should be a superstar who immediately raises the bar significantly. If not, I don't think we're necessarily in the right place in the first place. Um, uh, so I think it's really important that each person is assessed from a culture fit and, and my take on recruitment for, uh, for culture fit is multi-step, multi-people involved in a recruitment process so that people do move through a process and uh, 
let's be honest, recruitment is a dating process um, where we're trying to decide whether we want to spend more time with people. And uh, the, the first date moves on to a longer second date to a longer. And if you're lucky, you might get engaged and all things going well, we get married and we start working together. And, and that's, the, that's my take on, on recruitment. So in terms of uh, the, the negative input, uh, um, Zappos, very famous culture from the States, got a very clear term for people who don't fit their culture. They call them polluters. Uh, and they pollute the culture very, very quickly. So my answer to your question is, in, we need to be finding people who are incrementally adding to the culture every single time we add a new person to the team. And we need to be, have a robust process, um, ideally before um, selection is made to make sure the polluters don't join the team. And if they do, then that's when your work's cut out as a leader to, uh, to embrace on a one-to-one, on a in a one-to-one -one fashion to, to sort it out as quickly as you possibly can. That, that's my take. So I could just add to that then. Um, if the business, particularly, I guess, dynamic um, startup businesses where the culture can be incredibly fluid, how do you, how do you adjust the cultural perceptions around what you think you need in the business to, to broaden the culture or deepen the culture um, in the direction of business? Yeah, I might hand to Lise to, um, to, to share her, her experience on this, but, but my, my belief is that there needs to be a draft of a purpose or mission and a draft of your behaviours and a draft of where you're headed at any point in time. And I know that that's dynamic and changing, but at any moment in time, we have to have a bit of a feel as to what we expect at this moment in time. And then that can change, that can evolve. We, we've all been through a startup, but I, but I think if you don't be brave enough and bold enough to say, this is loosely what we accept and what we don't accept here, then I think you open yourselves up for, a, for big, big, big challenges. So that's, um, that would be my take. Yeah, so part A of the question around um, an impact of, of getting the right person or the wrong person in the business, I won't talk more currently, but uh, you know, I've had experiences years ago where I've brought people into the business and you know, it seemed great at the start and, and within a couple of months you just know there's just something that doesn't sit right. Their values just aren't aligned. The way that they deal with customers isn't aligned. Um, and, and for me, it, it's, got a, it's got a ripple effect within the team because what, one is the team don't have the same sense of pride for what you're actually doing with your customers. You know, they, they, uh, I think that the team then also look at you as a manager and as a leader uh, probably relatively negative because negatively in terms of you actually accepting mediocrity in your business. Um, so, you know, it does have a, a ripple effect when you get the wrong person in. It affects revenue, it affects culture. It even affects, for me personally, it even affects my actual passion for leading. You know, when you're actually dealing with someone that you're just going, oh my God, this person just does not get it. And it's just, it, it actually drains more energy out of you as a, as a leader than actually having the right people. So. So for me, you know, you very quickly, for me, intuitively know when someone's not the right fit for the business. Um, on, on the flip side, when you get someone in who, who is a, a positive influence, you know, it just feels like they've been there forever. They fit in very quickly. It doesn't take a lot to explain how things work because they intuitively operate in a way that, that is aligned with your business. And, and that, that's really exciting because you see things grow and you see you know, people being excited by the new energy that's coming in. So, so both sides particularly work. In terms of a, a startup and, and how to, I guess, um, navigate the culture that you want, I think, as Tristan said before, having a clear idea in your own mind around what the culture is in your business that you want. Now, um, having an HR consulting business, I would say, make sure you're clear of your vision and your mission and put those things down. Some people won't have that at the start. I think it probably took me three years in my own business to actually put that down. So I'd be lying if I said do it before you start hiring. Um, but in terms of actually knowing what's important in your business, I, I, think, it, I think, you know, there are some things that just as an individual, I know that there are um, certain behaviours that I just don't tolerate and I wouldn't tolerate in my business. And I think it's just being true to yourself by being able to say, what type of business am I creating? What is okay, what's not okay? And calling it early if it's not okay. Cool. And somebody else? Yes, gentleman at the front there. Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you both for super presentations and chats so far. Uh, something probably interesting is a specific example if don't mind around why you feel perhaps your organisation business has won those awards that would be one of the best places to live and if you could give perhaps some examples of those. But I know uh, through our work uh, that we do, 
Dan Sullivan, founder of Strategic Coach, says you hire people for their attitude, you keep them to train their skill, and then you remove people to send a message. So I'd just be interested in perhaps that final aspect around kind of the culture, people who aren't good cultural fit, how you've dealt with that, and also being aware that maybe other members of the team weren't as aware of the issues or the challenges that you were dealing with and how exiting that person out of the business, how you were able to maybe bring that back to a wider team as well. So we have two questions on the both of you. So I'll go with the easy one for a start, and, uh, and that is how, how we've won some awards. So the short answer is, um, I, I wholeheartedly believe that it's purpose, not perks, that, uh, that create a strong culture. And so a, a real clear purpose as to why the business exists, even if it's not documented and clear just yet, in, in your heart of hearts, if you understand what the purpose is, and then you can work hard to document that and get it to a relatively short and sharp statement, so then you can communicate that and stick to that purpose, I wholeheartedly believe that's a really important thing. And so from the year of 2009, which is after the fifth year struggle, the physio co started jumping from the rooftops and, and describing that we love older people and that we exist to help seniors stay mobile, safe and happy. And that was a really, really important part because we started a trade. Up until that point, there wasn't really a professional home for physiotherapists who like to work with older people. Uh, they, they sort of were on the fringe of the profession and here we were jumping up and down and saying, you want to work with older people, come over here and join us. Uh, so I think that was a, it's a really important part of, of, of what we're about. Um, in terms of winning the awards, there's no one big thing. It's a whole sequence of small things which are repeated over and over and over again. And, and so living the purpose is one of them. Using our core values to catch people doing something right. We absolutely live in an environment where we want to catch people doing something right. Praise in public, challenge in private. Uh, but use the core values as the stories, as the common language to, to bring that together. Um, I think there's, there's many other things, but maybe one, one quick example, and I already used this in a, in a presentation today, and that is the way we induct people into our team or welcome them. We actually have a dedicated day for people when they first start. It's called their welcome day, and the first part of their, their first day is about hearing about the past, the present, and the future of the physio code. Uh, and then at lunchtime we down tools and we, we have a little party and a party means eat some sandwich and, hot, and drink some water but, it's, but, it may, and, but we actually do have a party in the honour of the new team member. Um, for what it's worth that is the reception of the wedding uh, because we have got married and, uh, and we, we are having a party to celebrate them. But um, small things done welcome, in, a, in a welcome, caring, transparent and repetitive way, not repetitive in, in boring, but repetitive to make sure people are getting the same experience uh, is probably the answer to, the, uh, to the, the long question as to how the hell do you become a best place to work for 10 years in a row. Uh, there's no one answer to that question, I, I, don't, I don't think, but um, I'm going to pass the mic over to my friend Lise. <laughs> So um, I'm going to paraphrase here because I, I want to make sure that I pick up the right part of the second question, which was um, how have you dealt with exiting someone who's not right and what's the impact? Is, is that sort of the question so that I actually answer? Yeah, and probably how you then bring that message back to the wider team that you have. They may or may not be aware that that person was as big of an issue or as big of a cultural impact. Negatively on the business, they may have been an ally or a friend of that person. So how did you then deal with that? So why are Yeah, um, so it's an interesting question. So, so if I look back over the nine years of, of people that have exited the business that maybe aren't right, I don't think I've ever had to explain to the team why someone's left. Um, so if the other people in my business are aligned, uh, there's usually a sigh of relief <laughs> when that person has left and it usually hasn't been particularly controversial. Um, a lot of the time, I'm sort of getting feedback from the team or getting the vibe from the rest of the team that that actual person isn't the right fit in the business. So, so I very rarely have to actually communicate why someone has left if they're not right. And um, th there are a lot of times where I'm literally just having a really honest conversation with the person around the fit and what's right and what's not. And they've made the decision to leave because they also don't feel like they're a fit for the business. So um, it, it's interesting from a cultural perspective, I find that uh, there's not many people who think they fit in don't fit in, or vice versa, that my team think fit in, but they haven't fitted in, it's actually usually relatively obvious. It's just sometimes it's taken me longer to actually address it because 
I've actually needed the resource in there or I've thought that I actually need to hold on for whatever particular reason. But um, in, terms of, in terms of the exiting, I mean, I, I've seen, I can't tell you how many hundreds or thousands of people I've exited over the years, not in my own business, clearly I've only got a small business, um, but in other people's businesses. And I, I don't, th there's very few times that people, even in large businesses, the, the, the times that people actually need an explanation and, and you would very rarely go out and say, it's because someone was a bad fish. Um, but the only times that I've seen it is where businesses are big enough that people are working in different teams and they don't see that. Um, and so they haven't actually known that that person potentially was having performance issues. That's the only time where I think sometimes there needs to be an explanation behind it. Otherwise for me, um, it's been pretty self-explanatory. Cool. Great questions, guys. So can anybody I, else? Wait, I can I just jump on that question? You can well? indeed. Yeah. So, so to add and, and to I agree wholeheartedly with everything Lisa says, and I, and I think the one thing that can be important, the one time when people don't know that a person is not a culture fit, if the culture is not clear. Uh, and, and so if it's not clear what the goalposts are or how we should be behaving around here, then it's every man or woman for themselves. And that's the time when you when people may not realise that um, that person is doing damage to the culture because the owner or the founder or or the manager may be the only one who actually has got this feel idea as what the what culture they're trying to build. If they haven't d defined it and communicated it, that's when we can hit some hit some trouble. And from my experience, um, I, I had no defined culture at the physio co for the first five years till I, I decide on the direction we're going to head, and then we communicated the, the purpose, the values, and it was there was an inclusive process, but it didn't include all 20 team members. I'm a strong believer that you need the right people doing the right things, and not everyone agrees with this, not everyone agrees. Everyone, some people think that every team member should be involved in seeing the purpose and values and vision, and I, I don't agree with that. I think we get input, but we make sure we get the right people doing the right things um, to set the purpose, the vision, and, and the, the values. And so when they were set in our fifth year, uh, and then we communicated them to the team. Communicated to them th to communicated them to the team. Um, at that instant, the goalposts had shifted. They'd shifted from where people thought they might have been to now they are over there. They are very clear as to what we expect and where we're headed. And that's tough for team members. It's tough for team leaders, and it's tough for people to to adjust. The right people will will take a, a deep sigh of relief and say, "Phew." That is much clearer for me now and let's go. And I had three out of 20 people at the time who fought hard that that was not the direction that we should be going. Uh, you can probably imagine for yourselves whether they work at the PhysioCo or not anymore. <laughs> Great answers, guys. Just one second, sir. We'll just pass the mic and then... Hi, my name's Emmanuel. Um, I'd like to know, as successful business people, what's the best advice you can give to someone thinking of starting a business? G'day, Emmanuel. Good question. Uh, so, I, I've got two pieces of advice that, are, that I think are really important. And so, let's give me two and I'll sort of workshop this with you, Emmanuel, and see if we can get down to one. That'd be okay? You could even decide if you wanted to. Um, so I've got, I've got two very strong beliefs. They're related to what we do. One is culture is everything. Uh, that, that is the, the, the book that I wrote. It is my strong belief that if you want to get the business performance right, get the culture right. And I actually believe that the employee experience is more important than the customer experience because you get the employee experience right and the customer experience will, will follow. Uh, and the thing, second one, which is, which is deeper into my experience, is think big, act small. Uh, and I think it's really important that, that we've all got an idea, a belief, a, a something, a dream about it in our lives that we want to be better. We have to think big, but we have to act small continuously to bring that to life. So uh, which, which one do you choose, Emmanuel? Think big, act small. Good choice. Um, so uh, this isn't directed at you, this is directed at me starting a business if I was doing it again. The first one is to, to uh, talk to enough people to actually validate that the business has got a, a huge amount of substance um, before you start. Uh, or, uh, talk to the people that you respect, not a large number, sorry. The reason I say that is running a business is hard. Um, and after nine years, there are many times where I've sort of gone, oh my God, I wish I was just in a corporate and I didn't have to worry about where, uh, where the money was coming from to pay my staff at the end of the day and, and things like that. 
So the first one, if I was starting it, I'd just make sure I validate that it's a great business because if it is, when you get the validation and you're confident, you can then wholeheartedly have the confidence to run that business and know that it's going to be a rock star of a business uh, and you'll get huge amounts of rewards from, from, from doing that. Running a business is fun, um, but it's challenging at the same time. So first part for me is just making sure that, um, you know, it's got a huge amount of legs and, and therefore that you can go on the exciting journey, which, which would, is what I would do. In terms of running the business once it's up and running, uh, the key thing for me is actually getting the right people. If you get the right people, it's fun to work with them. You're doing awesome work. Uh, you know, you, you can be really proud of the work you're doing. When you've got the wrong people, it's, a, it's hard. You're at the front trying to pull people along. Um, you, it's deflating, it, it's difficult. So, so for me, I'd make sure you get the right people. And once you've got it, you're celebrating with them. You've got a rock star team, the culture's great. Um, and, and you're sort of flying. So, so for me, it's making sure you've got the right people. Right, thanks very much. We'll pass it to the gentleman in the white, but whilst we're waiting for that mic to go over, I've just got a quick question, guys. So um, obviously you're the leaders, you're setting the example. Um, do you have a sounding board for your own ideas and your own decisions that you make? Do you want me to go first? I've got the mic. Um, yeah, a couple, I, I've got a couple of people around me now that I've worked with uh, that have run their own businesses successfully and I'll often catch up. I caught up for lunch with, with uh, uh, two entrepreneurs uh, today that uh, you know I was bouncing an idea around and I get a huge amount of um, satisfaction in doing that because they will, they, they've, they've been there and grown businesses that are far bigger than mine uh, and they can just show me where the potholes are that otherwise I would have fallen in. <laughs> uh, so for me that, that's really useful. I, like Tristan, am also a part of EO which is an entrepreneurs organisation. Uh, so I catch up with monthly with a group of, of eight uh, fellow peers and they sort of almost act like an advisory board. So share the challenges, the wins, the, the you know, questions that I may have uh, asked. And that's, that's invaluable. You've got people who are, you know, it, it's not relying on consultants that you're paying big fees for to, to tell you how to do things. You're actually talking to other people who have run businesses and, and who genuinely want to help you avoid those pitfalls and celebrate the massive wins. So for me, they're the kind of people that I really bounce the ideas off, as well as family and friends. But... Um, but the others are probably a bit more structured. Uh, answer the question is yes. And yes, yeah, I've got a village of mentors um, that, that I refer to. It's, um, and, and what I mean by that is that I've got a very long-term mentor that's been with me on the journey to PhysioCo for all, all the 14 and a half years. Um, a wonderful person by the name of Ben Hosking, who I met of all places. So when I was studying the PhysioCo, I saw a, a, a um, business planning competition mentioned in my local leader newspaper. I applied, I got teamed up with a Rotarian who happened to be a semi-retired accountant by the name of Ben Hosking. And Ben Hosking has been with me as a supporter and a coach and a mentor for, Ben is now in his 80th year uh, and, uh, and been with me on this journey for almost 15. He's a, he's a wonderful person that I've, I've, I've learned so much from, not from the hard-nosed business perspective, but from a resilience, stick at it, be a good person, it pays to be a good person over a long period of time. More specifically, I've got mentors who help me with, with specific things. If I've got a marketing question I, or a marketing challenge, I go to that specific person. If I've got a finance-related challenge, I go to that specific person. So I think it's important to have coaches and mentors who are more um, general guidance and then there's specific functional experts to, uh, to, to really focus on. Thanks, guys. Uh, gentleman in the white, thank, thank you. you. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for your uh, authenticity and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, my real question is, Tristan, you touched on it, and Lisa, I'm sure you can too. There's this, uh, this decision where you said that you didn't know all the answers and it was great to be able to uh, find other people who could help you. And I'm wondering, um, I myself can think of a million different things I don't know, I don't know which, often I don't know which way to turn. So are there any notable stories from your past in which yeah, the, you were able to turn to somebody and you wish you'd turn to that person earlier for expert advice? I think the answer's got to be yes. Uh, as in, uh, I certainly wish that I'd solved some challenges earlier because um, uh, plenty of sleepless nights uh, is, is sort of pretty, pretty common in my neck of the woods. Uh, but the answer is, uh, I think priorities are really important. And so knowing what is the biggest challenge and will have the biggest effect on the business at any moment in time is the, the question that I need to ask myself on a regular basis. And when I ask that question and I, and I 
pretty sure I've got my answer, then I dive into asking the person about, about that side of things. And so for example, if I, when I was completely stuck with my big mess in 2009, if I'd gotten deep into understanding finances at that point in time, it would not have helped me. It was, that was not the challenge that I was facing. Uh, similarly, at a time when we had a breakup with a large client and we had a buzzing culture, things were going well, but we were having, gonna have this revenue drop off a cliff, um, that's when I needed to get deep into the numbers and, and really firm on cash flow forecasting and, and that, that type of thing. So I guess the answer is there are so many things we can learn and it'd be great to learn them all in advance, but know where you are at that moment in time, know what the biggest challenge, the biggest bottleneck or the biggest speed hump is, dive into it head on and, and then deal with that one and then move on to the to, to the next challenge is is my experience. It's it's as simple as I can I can I can respond. Cool. Guys, we're coming towards the end now. Um, so maybe the last one or two questions. Can we just have a show of hands who's actually got a question for us? Anybody else still out there? Is it just that one lucky gentleman? Okay, excellent. Before our, sorry, before you jump in, can I just, I want one bit of practical advice to what, what Lisa just said then, and that is that if you want to reach out to someone who's got commercial experience and you, you've seen them, you know them, you, uh, you know how that you think that you can get experience from them, let me uh, give you a quick tip. Do not send them a, a general note or message that says, can I please buy your coffee and pick your brains? Spare me. In all, in all seriousness, I, I don't mean to be mean or rude about this sort of stuff, but everyone likes their ego stroked a little bit. So just a one sentence that said, love your work on something. I've got a, speci oh, a specific question. I'd love to ask you about this. Can I please have a small amount of your time? Would be a wonderful way to start the relationship from my perspective, um, as opposed to a long-winded message um, or a general, general approach. So be really tight on the way you communicate with people to, to build the best relationships. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, just a, a quick point here. Culture is one of these things that we knew nothing about when we started, and as we progress, we've learned a lot about it. We now understand how important it is, uh, but it's still something that we feel very unskilled in. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations for where to get, you know, whether books to read, courses, exercises to do, uh, but basically, after time, where to get yeah. Did you um, plant this guy? Well, I did, do you know it's a good time. It's a good timing. But anyway, so Tristan's actually got a couple of books at the front as well. So, um, so if anybody else wants to have a conversation with Tristan at the end, and um, maybe get, I mean, it's a very limited number, so um, that could be a starting point for yourself there. But if there's anything else, then yeah. So. Uh, this was not supposed to happen, but I did write a book called Culture is Everything, and that is the book that, that we're talking about. Um, but on the, on the same topic, there's many, many places to, to start. Um, oh, look, where, where do you start? I think from, there's some basic places to start as to how to act as a leader and a manager, and I would start with something as simple as the new One Minute Manager. is a very simple um, uh, behavioural book as to, as to how to behave as a, as a leader and a manager, and we use it at the Physio Co. Uh, I think there's plenty of other books uh, from a, a larger business perspective, Good to Great, that I spoke about is wonderful. Uh, and there's also some other books out there. There's a book that I only got last week. It's called Trust Rules. And it's a, it's a guide to managers as to how to, um, to build a trust, trustworthy or trusting workplace, um, worthy, worthy of uh, checking out as well. They're my three tips, but I reckon Lisa's got a couple more. Uh, so again, I'll go a slightly different angle um, rather than sort of references of books. I think I think Tristan sort of hit on some of the, the really great ones to to touch on. I'd go back into your to your business and just sit down for a second and, and work out what is working and what's not working in your business. So just actually taking some time out to sort of be able to say, uh, what are the things that I'm liking about the culture in the business? What am I not liking about the culture in the business? If you don't know, talk to your staff. You know, get a sense from them. Don't be afraid. To, to ask them the question. Know that when you ask the question, sometimes there's an expectation that something's gonna be done about it. So if you consistently get, for, it, it, I, I deal with clients all the time that do engagement surveys, um, go and report the results back and then do nothing with it. That's actually less motivating than asking the question to start with. Um, so set the expectation up from the start that just picking your brain, you know, if it was your business, what would you do differently? What do you think some of the things are that we could improve on? Can't guarantee that I'm gonna be able to change all the things, but I'm just interested in, in your opinion and thank them for their opinion. 
Um, so you get an idea of what's working well and what's not working well versus your expectation around what it is. Um, go and talk to people who've got businesses that you think have got great cultures. You know, so for me, from a practical sense, people who are doing it really well uh, can, can share some of the things that work really well and that don't work really well in the business. Be careful not to get caught into the cherry on top stuff. Um, you know, we're talking before around, I've seen businesses that, have, as I said, have got basketball courts in there, they've got foosball tables, they've got everything and the culture's crap. Um, it, it doesn't replace it if you don't have good leadership, clear vision. So, so I think for me, those are the questions I would ask. As a leader, am I living the values that I think are important? And if I don't know what they are, work out what they are. <laughs> um, then make sure that you actually adhere to what you expect from your staff. Make sure that you've got the team that you think is the right team. Um, and they're adhering to them and they're clear on what the goals are. And if you can do that, you're pretty much 75% there. You know, the other stuff is genuinely cherry on top. And I was saying to, to Wayne for some of the stuff that I've seen, I've, you know, there are some businesses that when people start, they send welcome packs. Mattel used to, I, I believe, I don't know if they do now. Um, when people joined, they used to send packs of um, toys as soon as someone signed a contract. So four weeks before they started, they got a box with all these cool Mattel toys so that they could actually start to experience what it was like to work at Mattel or, you know, there are loads of cool things that I've seen. People who um, get their staff's car washed every two weeks so they don't have to do it on the weekend to save them time, you know, so it costs them very little to get someone to come and wash five cars or 10 cars, you know, during the week. There's some cool cherries on the top, but just careful you don't get sucked into them when you talk to other businesses because some businesses I speak to focus so much on that, but when you actually talk to the staff, they're not actually really that happy. Um, and, and they don't have some of those core things actually sorted. So for me, from a practical sense, I'd, I'd just be going back and actually working out, is the culture what you want it? And if not, why not? And if it's around people, address it. You know, and that's a hard thing with small businesses because sometimes you think, can't afford to replace them. If they're not here, I'm gonna have to pick up the work. Then you're accepting the culture. I think I, I'm sure I'm quoting something someone said that's famous as opposed to it's clearly not my quote, but. Um, you know, if you walk past something, basically, you know, you walk past a certain behaviour or, or a certain, you know, behaviour in society or in your business and you don't do anything about it, you're accepting that that's the norm. That, that's pretty much the same for me in a business. If, if you see people who are mucking around, leaving early, talking, you know, um, not respectfully to their teammates and you don't do anything about it, that's the culture that you're setting. So, so know that when you're seeing those things and you're not addressing them, you're actually accepting that that's the norm. So, so for me, it's just actually taking a check. And once you've done that yourself, the books are really, really helpful. So definitely get onto those. But I think intuitively, if you actually sit down and spend time, you'll probably pick up 50% of the stuff that you need to work on. Excellent. Great. Great questions, everybody. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to our guest speakers this evening for their generosity with, uh, with their time and also their answers. So thank you very much. Can you join me in a round of applause for our first guest speaker, Tristan White of The Physioco. Thank you very much, Tristan. Thank you. Uh, and Lisa Spiden as well of Fiber HR. So thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you.